A huge welcome to our global viewers from the Middle East Policy Council, located in Washington, D.C. My name is Sarah Schaefer, and I am the Council's Director of Communications and Congressional Liaison. We look forward to a thought-provoking discussion today with Dr. Tova Norlin regarding her essay, Middle East Pre-Existing Conditions, Regional Security After COVID-19, that was published in our Middle East Policy Journal. Our Contributor Dialogue series offers U.S. policymakers short video discussions on timely issues related to foreign policy matters in the Middle East. Our Contributor Dialogues leverage the subject matter and expertise, as well as geographic diversity of our contributors to our world-renowned Middle East Policy Journal. Learn more about our journal and how to subscribe on our website www.mepc.org. We are so fortunate to welcome our guest, Dr. Tova Norlin. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'd like to begin by briefing our audience with the core of your research and overarching argument to provide some background for those who have not had a chance to read your article yet. Could you outline your research process in Middle East pre-existing conditions, regional security after COVID-19, first describing when your research was conducted? Yeah, so my research was actually conducted over uh, a long period of, of time, I'd say a few months, but in the middle of the COVID lockdown. So um, it really gave me a lot of time to search for statistics, um numbers effects you know impacts from COVID on the MENA region um but because I couldn't really travel right I couldn't travel at all I also made sure to try to check fact check and reality check some of my statistics you know my my findings with people on the ground uh, and you know the many connections that I do have in in parts of the you know across the Arab world so it was uh pretty long time in, in coming, but it was a, almost a cathartic uh, process of, of uh, fact finding and writing. That's excellent. And you described the pre-existing conditions for instability in the Middle East that were then exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Could you highlight some of these conditions that you referenced sort of in your overarching argument? Yeah, so the idea with the pre-existing conditions is that um, it's it's not just to understand the immediate effects of uh, the pandemic, but also how it was at least predicted to impact uh, regional security and stability. So um, in some ways, the Middle East came into the pandemic uh, late, later than the Western world, later than other parts of the world, um, but it already suffered from um, some, uh, well, I would say a, a decline over the preceding decade in some important indicators for quality of life, socioeconomic, political uh, conditions that had really deteriorated since the 2011 Arab Spring. So uh, because of this, it was more vulnerable to these risk factors um, that really um, make uh, the likelihood of political violence uh, basically raises the, the the risk of political violence. It absolutely makes sense. And you linking that theory and concept with security concerns is kind of a primary objective of your piece. To quote the article, you voiced that a real decline in income, quality of life, and access to healthcare for a large number of people leaves a country vulnerable to political unrest. Combined with repressive government responses and corruption, such unrest leads to state fragility, radicalization, and extremism then become more likely. Could you expand on this theory and the link kind of between fragility and security considerations, especially in, as you mentioned, um, repressive government regime? Sure. <clears throat> So fragility is sort of the opposite of, of resilience and resilience really means it's hard to measure resilience. It's kind of like democracy where um, if everything is perfect, you know, that's resilience. But what you can measure though um, is fragility. Um, 
and and just to go back to resilience, resilience is uh, the ability of a country to absorb shocks, to uh, be able to mitigate them and also recover. And so fragility, um, you can measure uh, because uh, there's a you can measure the lack of these perfect conditions. And especially with respect to uh, political uh, rights, uh, governance, uh, economic equality, well-being, um, social political, you know, aspects, and so there's there's a number of risk factors there, and and it's the accumulation of these risk factors that make societies and countries more vulnerable to political violence, because as as fragility goes up, then grievances go up, and authoritarian states in particular often react with repressive uh, military tactics. And that kind of starts this vicious cycle of, um, you know, authoritarianism, dissent, repression, and conflict. And and so that's how, uh, you know, COVID nineteen and in the most immediate conditions, such as you know uh, the lack of health care facilities or, um, you know, the the inability to to disseminate vaccines how all of those things kind of start adding up towards it actually uh, becoming, um, society becoming even more vulnerable to, to political fragility and violence. And has this connection been seen in any other historic examples outside of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, so I think that the best comparison and, and which I actually make in the paper is, is you know, between uh, the period right before the Arab Spring and in 2019 before uh, the, the pandemic. And uh, because the Arab Spring was a call for, you know, uh, basically freedom of expression, uh, democracy, political participation, rule of law, better opportunities. But the trigger uh, for the Arab Spring was really economic decline or rise in prices. Bread was in particular, you know, the issue at that time. And, and all of these things after the Arab Spring, rather than get better, as of course, all these young people who came to the streets hoped, actually started, got worse. So the MENA, all MENA countries declined on all of these different indicators. Uh, and their scores are now lower in terms of, you know, less democracy, more conflict, more displaced people. Uh, and 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 so uh, in 2019, before the pandemic, political analysts were actually predicting uh, a some sort of uprising across the region uh, before you know as as because the conditions were so similar. And in some ways, COVID saved some of these governments because they were able to clamp down on these protests that were taking place across uh, many countries. And, uh, um, and so that's, I think, the interesting comparison here. And you specifically build on that idea by citing that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the region already seemed at a boiling point. You specifically reference protests against Sudanese bread prices, the more political demonstrations in Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq. Was this regional political dissatisfaction abnormal for the Middle East? Or would you say that that was, um, you know, we just had the Arab Spring, you said in 2019 as the pandemic led in, and then during the pandemic, do you see a continuation in a trend or an escalation? So I definitely think that there was an escalation in tensions. Uh, we'd had, as I mentioned, a downward spiral in, in some of these conditions that, you know, measure quality of life. Um, and there's also been increasing in, uh, inequality across the region, both between countries and within countries. So there's sectors of populations in these, some of these large uh, countries like Egypt uh, that are extremely poor and, and where there's huge income gap. And lack of opportunities, especially for young people. And so um, from that perspective, you know, those conditions had gotten a lot worse uh, 
And so, yes, I do believe that it was very close to some sort of, you know, eruption, explosion, you know, or, or which is exactly, you know, it was happening. And then COVID kind of put a stop to that. Um, yeah. That's a really interesting way to evaluate kind of where we were at that point of time, pre and during the beginning of the pandemic. You also discuss the se evolving security dynamics of the region. Specifically, you reference Abraham Accords, the NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan, a decrease in terrorist activity, and an increase in transnational and national conflicts. Could you describe that environment as we enter this boiling point? Yeah, I think it's especially interesting to look from a U.S. perspective uh, as uh, you know, a really important actor in the region. Uh, you know, during the Obama administration, there was a Chinese pivot. Uh, and then, you know, when Trump came, there was a clear signal to especially uh, some of the U.S., uh, the closest allies to, to the U.S. in the region, the larger states, Israel, Saudi Arabia, for instance, that the U.S. was moving away from engaging directly. And I think they realized that they had shared interests, one, to keep the US engaged in the region, um, but also that they shared you know, a, a number of threats, including terrorism, uh, Iran, um, and, and the, the mountain, mounting human insecurity from the regional conflicts, of course. And so Israel's always pushed uh, relations with its neighbors, but, but Arab, the Arab states have been reluctant because of the, the Palestinian problem. And, and I think now these authoritarian leaders have gotten to a point where they realize that they're more threatened by economic instability uh, than, than political opinion, because there is in some ways uh, growing inequality and growing um, you know, polarization or, or a growing gap between the leaders and the people sort of on the street. And, and the Gulf states in particular realized that there were enormous benefits from um, allying with Israel, both in terms of you know, economic and technology uh, uh, cooperation, but even more because that in some ways um, guaranteed that they'd stay close to, to the US. And, and uh, the Abram Accords obviously was in some ways a, um, you know, it was, it, sort of came out of that, right? And the fact that they realized that they had shared interests in deterring Iran um, and in, in keeping the US engaged. Um, and, and in the beginning, that's why it was largely an arms deal in the beginning. And then as uh, you know, these economic ties began, I think it's, it's become much more um, useful and very positive in, in the sense that it's actually uh, impacting and, and, and it's actually improving uh, regional stability. That's a really excellent exemplification of where the region stood headed into the pandemic and how the environment looked before. Um, I'd love to transition to a reflection of this research two years after the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll acknowledge here that while we are not in an entirely post-COVID world, we are beginning to see the repercussions of the pandemic when it was at its height. And so we'll be looking at that with this analysis. Um, you continue in your article and you say, the stability of the Middle East in the medium and long term depends on the region's ability to recover from these shocks and the willingness of regional powers and global actors to invest more readily in processes that support just and equitable economic development, social justice, and comprehensive civil and political rights. Could you begin by identifying timelines for medium and long-term stability? Where are we right now in the aftermath process? So, so basically, you know, with short term, you're talking about vaccine distribution, um, you know, hospital beds, economic relief, um, but also politically, I think uh, that's when many of the governments in the region were, um, you know, curbing uh, freedom of assembly and, and demonstrations or, or uh, political expression, things like that. 
uh, I would say that medium term, we're seeing, you know, is when you're seeing larger shocks to the economy, um, when some of the, the curbing of political expressions may be, um, be become long term and become permanent. And, and as a result, you might see a real drop in income, some job loss, um, fiscal collapse, which we're definitely seeing, um, and also rising authoritarianism as governments um, take sort of steps to, I would say, uh, curb some of the instability and also to remain in power. Um, and in the long term, which I think, you know, if I, I am not an economist, so I can't say exactly, but I would guess that we're somewhere between the medium term and the long term right now. And in the long term, that's where we're talking about uh, sort of uh, permanent impacts where where the, the development kind of drops one level uh, rather than recover. And we're talking there about like a downward economic spiral where you see significant disruptions in the labor market, for instance, um, it just never recovers. Um, education with sort of loss of human capital because kids didn't go to school or because, because poverty has risen enormously. Um, and also again, rising authoritarianism because some of the steps that governments have taken to uh, uh, get more control over society have in some ways remained and, and become permanent. Excellent. That is a very good visualization of kind of what was happening um, among each of these phases. You discuss the evolving relationship between government authorities and civilian civil liberties, specifically expressing concern that COVID-related emergency legislation will prove permanency beyond the pandemic. What are examples of this and have you seen this to be true? Yeah, so the, the example that I, that I take in the paper, um, I think one of them is Egypt, and Egypt is, is probably, uh, you know, the one that's most relevant here. Egypt has basically been under constant state of emergency since the 1980s, almost constant, I'd say. They also have instituted very strict anti-terrorism laws uh, that they tend to apply whenever it kind of suits, uh, in some ways, suits the, the political leadership. Uh, so during COVID-19, they added uh, amendments to the emergency law. Um, and, and some of those amendments had to do with, uh, you know, uh, political gatherings, um, political expression, uh, freedom of, of, of sort of the media, what you could say and so on. And, and these, because they were added to an emergency law that's always in place, then were really made permanent beyond the pandemic and are now um, in some ways, you know, they can be used by the government uh, to crack down on opponents, political dissidents, um, or, or, you know, journalists, people who are, um, who are critical of the regime. And, and during the pandemic, they were used to crack down on, on you know, some journalists who were critical of the government's handling of the regime. Uh, it, they actually cracked down on, on some doctors who were, you know, telling the truth about what was going on in the hospitals. And, and this took place not just in Egypt, but also in some other countries like Bahrain or the UAE. Um, and another country that actually had um, you know, some stricter emergency laws during the time also was, was Tunisia. Most of the countries I'd say had something, um, you know, that expanded their powers on society. That transitions perfectly on your Tunisia reference to my next question. As I was reviewing your piece, I was perhaps most astonished by your inclusion of potential democratic backsliding in Tunisia which at the time was the poster child of democracy in the Middle East. To cite, you say, according to Freedom House Index for Democracy, only a single country in the MENA region, Tunisia, has made any democratic progress since the Arab Spring. Yet scholars warn that even Tunisia is at risk as judicial and institutional reforms have been slow. 
regional conflict analysis isn't always conducted through the lens of the COVID-19 pandemic impacts, and I see that with Tunisia. Do you see the political situation in Tunisia as largely a result of the pandemic or very ingrained in problems that were rooted from government responses to COVID-19? Yeah, so so that's a good question because I think because I think that the latter is definitely right that that the crisis did start before the pandemic, but it was exacerbated definitely by and enabled by by the pandemic. Um, you mentioned Tunisia as the only country coming out of the Arab Spring with improvements in democracy. Unfortunately, now as as you know, it's also it's regressed uh, because of of developments over the past uh, two years in particular. Um, but having said that, looking back before the pandemic, um, there were a lot of there was a lot of turmoil, uh, political infighting, inefficiency, uh, almost a culture war between the religious, uh, religious and the secular. And then during the same time, there was a sharp economic decline. Um, really, really uh, uh, heightened fiscal stress where the government always, almost, almost went into default. Um, and as the pandemic grew worse and the response was inefficient, there was a paralysis between the president and the parliament and the prime minister in particular. And so there was a lot of frustration and also actually some, you know, quite a bit of popular support for President Said's measures to basically sack the parliament, um, abolish the Judicial Council, and begin this process of rewriting the Constitution, which then passed uh, recently with about 90-something, 4% or something, but obviously with only 30% of the population voting. And so, so it's, and the new Constitution obviously then gives him expanded powers uh, over the judicial system, the legislative process, um, and he's He's uh, really uh, enacting, you know, some of the tough legislation and taking these out on his opponents, like the anti-terrorism laws he's using to arrest, you know, former parliamentarians. Uh, and he's cracking down the media with the anti-disinformation um, uh, uh, laws. And so I think it's a good example of empowered elites in the region that are threatened by political instability. Uh, they want to stay in power. And as a result, they crack down on, on dissent. And did you predict that such significant political transitions would surface this quickly after the pandemic outbreak? I would say that I thought that it would be even quicker or more. I mean, I'm actually surprised that it hasn't um, been more widespread that the, the region, region actually has rebound quite strongly, uh, much stronger than even economists predicted. When I was writing the, the, the article, uh, you know, the picture was much more bleak. Uh, however, though, I should say the, the you know, rebound has not been um, uniform across the region. And Obviously, the impact is felt felt much uh, more in fragile and conflict affected states, uh, and it also hasn't been uniform across sectors in in countries. So, the more vulnerable uh, parts of the populations are the ones that are suffering the most. That's interesting timeline analysis, and actually a little bit of an optimistic take, um, which is always good to hear. Transitioning to the economic impacts of the pandemic um, and the security environment of the region. You cite that GCC at oil exporting countries, um, mentioning that fossil fuels dropped in demand in 2020, picking back up by 4.2% in 2021. Despite these fluctuations, your research further cited that the least vulnerable Middle East states are the large GCC oil producers with relatively stable autocratic governments. How can these countries utilize this economic safety net to enhance domestic stability? And how does this um, economic privilege change their response to the pandemic? So, so uh, you know, the larger uh, countries, 
obviously were able to give much larger uh, COVID relief packages, both to their citizens as well as businesses because of, of their, you know, wealth, um, especially in terms of, you know, from the fossil fuel um, economy. Um, and that's part of the, the Middle Eastern sort of authoritarian bargain where uh, you give generous subsidies to your population in return for uh, your grip on political power and loyalty. And, um, but, but these countries were obviously also very impacted by the drop in, in demand for oil. Um, and, and so, so I, I, I think COVID was a little bit of a wake up call that they need to diversify their economies. Um, uh, they obviously have a large uh, percentage of, of um, foreign workers also in their societies and those, uh, communities were especially vulnerable and it took a long time to kind of deal with that and and to to provide some sort of assistance to to them as well uh, because they were basically stuck right and um and i also think that that they realized because they need to diversify that they need to uh start uh building stability in the region because if if they want you know a, a an economic market then they need regional stability. They need to work to resolve the, the regional conflicts, for instance. Absolutely. And you mentioned that many economists fear that vulnerabilities exposed during the pandemic may result in economic scarring in many sectors. Does this include oil sectors and energy sectors? And has this concern overall upheld in relevancy? So the energy and oil sectors, uh, actually, uh, you know, they recovered pretty, uh, pretty well. Um, and so, so I don't think there's a concern there. I think there's a concern having seen what can happen to the, uh, to, to that sector. And, you know, from there, taking the step to say, look, we need to actually diversify and, and not just do one thing. And so, um, but I do, you know, the scarring is, I think I mentioned this a little bit before that the, the scarring um, is probably worse in some other sectors, especially in the developing economies and the oil in importers uh, like Egypt that has a very large informal uh, economy with, uh, you know, a big part of their labor force uh, working in this informal economy with, with no, uh, actual structured um, in no structured environment. And so so this the scarring then can uh, is probably going to happen in 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 those uh, societies where there's been impact on um, you know education, um, the labor markets, the corporate climate perhaps where there's vulnerabilities um, and government policies, that are not really allocating resources fairly across, um, you know, uh, populations. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, but... absolutely. That provides really useful impact into the long-term effects of the pandemic and what that looks like across different countries um, with different priorities and um, wealth. It feels, this conversation feels incomplete without adding another layer of analysis to the table. While writing this, you um, obviously were not able to predict the impact of the Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the Middle East region, which adds another lens. You know, you have, as you mentioned, this boiling point environment, and then COVID is layered on top of that, and then the economic and political impacts of the Russia-Ukraine war add another layer to this sort of security environment that feels as though it's drifting somewhere else. Could you talk about the impact of the war in Ukraine and how that's interplaying with these pre-existing dynamics? Yeah, so you're right, uh, absolutely, in that uh, the impacts of the war are really exacerbating um, and and in some ways compounding the the already you know the effects of, of COVID over the past you know a couple of years and and I think the impact um, you know you could kind of talk about it um, economically politically and security wise 
um, you know, economically, the, the most immediate effects that we've seen is, is this uh, grain crisis, right, where uh, many of the, the MENA states rely to almost up to 80% on Ukrainian or Russian grain. And so that obviously uh, risks uh, raising prices, which then uh, may lead to consequences down the road where governments are unable to, unable to afford uh, the subsidies. And that then can lead to political instability and you know, grievances. And, and bread has a history of actually uh, causing violence in, in the Middle East, as we know. Uh, politically, as I talked about before, uh, rising instability then leads to rising or increased repression and, you know, increased, uh, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, governments to want to uh, make sure that they stay in power. And so, so this um, obviously also begins this vicious cycle that can lead to political violence, terrorism, and so on. Um, Russia has been very influential in the region in the past and has uh, many partnerships, economic, um, you know, military as well. And so, so Arab governments are hedging because because of these relationships that have been very important in the past. And this is important for, I think, Western countries to understand that it's not very clear cut in the Middle East. And so that is definitely an impact, I think, that we're seeing. But most importantly, um, security and security wise, um, there obviously is continued regional power struggle between the larger states. Uh, but if we go back to Russia, um, they have been pulling their troops from Syria and also pulling some of their Wagner uh, troops from, from different places, Syria, Le uh, Libya. And, and that is in creating a security vacuum in some of the most fragile uh, areas, especially Syria, which is um, obviously a region in conflict. And Iran is moving their troops, basically IRGC troops in, and that's threatening Israel directly. So, so that's raising the level of volatility in the region. Um, and there's regional hegemons, I would say, um, Iran that is inserting instability through proxies. And so, um, so all of this is, is leaving the, the region much more volatile in terms of, of security, I think. You've really thoroughly described the lead up to and the current um, influences on the security environment of the region. I'd like to conclude by reflecting on the region's shifting geopolitical sphere, which you begin to reference um, when discussing Russian engagement with the region. The United States has withdrawn a multitude of forces from the Middle East in the past decade or so. Countries are normalizing relations with Israel and with each other. You see Turkey and Saudi Arabia meeting, Syria re-entering regional policy conversations, such as with the UAE. Has the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic shaped this present day dynamic and this opening of conversation that you see as a trend emerging in the region? Yeah, I actually, I definitely think so. Um, I think, the fact that COVID had a global impact, including on the US, including on Western states, um, really caused some of the Arab states that are used to being bailed out by the West in, in times of crisis, it caused them to, in some ways, grow up and, and realize that they had to be responsible for their own uh, uh, stability, their own national interests. And so, there's a growing responsibility or, or feeling of a responsibility, I think, in the region um, to fix both, you know, their own stability and and um, and the region, which obviously can can be both good uh, or bad. In terms of bad, um, the security vacuum is is being exploited by uh, hegemonic states that that are sort of inserting instability uh, through proxies. Um, but I'd say that the good part here um, so far has in some ways been more dominant and, and that's 
that these larger status quo powers um, like Saudi Arabia, um, Israel, UAE are interested in both um, political and economic stability. Um, and they've become much more calculated in their defense uh, alliances and, and, and they've realized that uh, they can really benefit economically from ex ex uh, expanding um, you know, the Abraham Accords and, and the relationships they have with Israel, which is the strongest power obviously in the region. And even though the Abraham Accords um, are still in their infancy, um, I think they're also now after COVID and perhaps because of COVID, uh, able to use that um, environment to start addressing human insecurities across the region uh, because they realize they cannot ignore those because they will affect them, such as refugees, um, uh, you know, climate insecurity, uh, conflicts, uh, and so on. And, and so, so in that sense, I think COVID actually um, helped uh, start this regional discussion, and we had, um, yeah, so I think that's. That is excellent analysis, and we are so grateful to have had you participate in this contributor dialogue and to discuss your article, Middle East Pre-Existing Conditions, Regional Security After COVID-19. As a reminder for our audience, if you'd like to learn more and read the article itself um, or watch this recording um, on an excellent interview. It is all available at www.mepc.org. Dr. Norlin, we thank you so much for contributing to our journal and for participating in this event today. Many thanks from the Middle East Policy Council. Have a good day. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.